start the recording. All right, well, good morning and welcome everyone to day two of National Distance Learning Week and our Open SUNY webinar series. If you could, please take a moment and let us know where you're tuning in from in the chat window. That would be great to see uh, where everybody is located. And also, your mics are muted um, at this point. I will unmute the mics and you can feel free to um, ask questions of our presenter today. You can also type questions into the chat window and I'll make sure that those get read as well. Um, and also there's time for Q&A at the end. So however you prefer. National Distance Learning Week is celebrated annually and the intent there is to generate a greater awareness and appreciation for distance learning while recognizing leaders like uh, Drew Khan and best practices in our field. So we at Open SUNY aim to showcase the expertise of professionals who are engaged in this day-to-day -day practice of distance learning in a variety of, of exciting ways, as you'll see today. My name is Erin Maney. I am the Manager of Communications and Community Engagement at Open SUNY. On behalf of the Open SUNY team, I wanna welcome all of you to the showcase webinar as part of National Distance Learning Week. And on the next slide, I will introduce our speaker. Today, uh, we are pleased to host Drew Khan from Buffalo State College, who will be sharing about the Anne Frank Project and the power of stories. Drew Khan is a distinguished service professor at SUNY Buffalo State, where he has taught acting, devised theater, and directed productions for 26 years. He taught K-12 populations for 10 years previous to his work in higher education. He is the founding director of the Anne Frank, Anne Frank Project, which is a multi-layered social justice initiative at SUNY Buffalo State that utilizes the wisdom of Anne Frank as a springboard for the examination of genocide and intolerance through the lens of story and performance. He presents and teaches internationally on the universal language of stories and the intersection of story, conflict resolution, and community building, most recently, as you'll hear, in Rwanda, Kenya, and Switzerland. So Drew, on behalf of the Open SUNY team, I thank you for joining us today and for sharing what you know. Thank you, Erin, and I uh, really appreciate being part of this. Thanks for inviting me, and uh, it's especially nice to talk to so many people when I don't even have to leave my office. So the power, the power of SUNY, right? Thank you so much. Um, I'm open to people asking questions as I move through, and we can make this as, as, as much a dialogue as it is a presentation, but I'm really, uh, I'm really excited to share the work that we're doing, and through just very simple uh, technology and Skype, um, we've managed to do quite a bit with our work um, with the Anne Frank Project. I'll talk a, a little bit about that. Um, the Anne Frank Project um, is in its 11th year now, and as Aaron mentioned, it is um, a, a social justice initiative of SUNY Buffalo State. And there's two, as, as you know, two SUNY campuses, and we're the one that's, that's in the city, Buffalo State, the uh, liberal arts comprehensive. Um, AFP, the Anne Frank Project, really fits nicely with Buffalo State's mission, uh, community engagement, social justice, international education. And uh, obviously throughout the years, we've matched our values with the, with the values of the campus. And there's, there's been strong support both on the campus and also from the SUNY system. So I'm really appreciative of that. Uh, there really wouldn't be an Anne Frank Project without that kind of support. But uh, I, I'm a theater professor that, that, whose research is all about theater outside the theater. How can we use stories um, outside the theater and in particular to teach valuable lessons in conflict resolution, community building and identity exploration. Um, in 2006, I directed a production of the Diary of Anne Frank and we had two Anne Franks because I wanted to reach our very diverse student audience. Uh, here at Buffalo State, well, over half of our kids are non-white and come from a variety of cultural socioeconomic backgrounds, a virtual melting pot, a true melting pot. And so uh, I had two Anne Franks, a Jewish Anne Frank and a quote unquote Rwandan Anne Frank, um, suggesting that there's an Anne Frank in every genocide. And uh, in that attempt to meet our, our diverse audience halfway, uh, that was the birth, that was the genesis of the Anne Frank Project. And if you fast forward 11 years, we do an annual social justice festival um, and lots of uh, programming in the schools. But today I really wanna talk about our international work uh, in Rwanda, in Kenya, uh, and, and how we use distance learning to extend our work. Uh, I bring students to Rwanda every, um, every summer 
I bring anywhere from 10 to 15 students and we've done well over 100 students, faculty and staff. We immerse ourselves in their amazing recovery uh, from the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. And our students learn about those valuable lessons of forgiveness, community building, um, identity, uh, shifting your narrative. And um, our collaboration is in particular in a, in a region of Rwanda called Muhanga. Muhanga is the official international sister city of Buffalo, New York. So um, I'm really the mule of, for that, <laughs> that relationship, and I carry uh, gifts and um, greetings back and forth for those mayors, but it, but it opens up doors for us uh, in a way that has been very successful. So we train during our two, two and a half weeks in Rwanda, we train, my, my students and I train about 85 public school teachers in Rwanda both primary and secondary teachers, and they, they come from about 60, 65 different schools. So we train them in three 12-hour days in the focus of my work, which we call story-based learning, using story as a curricular vehicle in the classroom. You can imagine that our work uh, excels in, on the continent of Africa because uh, training Africans to use story is like training fish to use water. It's, it, it's in their blood, it's in their, it's in their DNA. So it's a very physical, uh, kinesthetic type of work. It's on your feet. It is moving the content from the brains of the students to their hearts using their bodies. And we train those teachers, uh, like I said, in three 12 hour days. And then that's the important introduction to the work, but maybe the, mo the more important part is that we stay in touch uh, via distance learning and Skyping with my students and I, and we are in the classrooms with the teachers and outside the classrooms with the teachers once a week, twice a week, three times a week, depending on the schools. So we've had a significant impact uh, in a way that we would never have if we just reserved our contact with those teachers to be just um, just once a year. We would never be able to have that follow through and that connection. So I would say about 90% of our work with our Rwandan teachers, and I'll get to Kenya too, to our, with our Rwandan teachers is virtual, is through um, Skype and laptops and connecting with Rwandans and their teachers and in their classrooms. So some really exciting things have happened. Rwanda, uh, post-genocide, restructured everything, their constitution, their education system. And initially, they, they were a knowledge-based curriculum, very much like the West, but then they started running into similar problems like we have in the West. And they, in the past six years, have moved from a knowledge-based curriculum to a competency-based curriculum. President Kagame said publicly, what does it matter what Rwandan students know if they don't know what to do with what they know. I think that's a simple but powerful idea that we can also use in the West. Um, and they expected this competency-based curriculum with, of course, not a lot of training. So in comes our work. Our work is a perfect match for competency-based kinesthetic experiential education. Um, whether it's at the micro level, just circling up in the beginning of class and physically engaging and getting ready for that, that sacred learning ahead or, or using stories for the entire unit or structuring a unit in science and math and English. Um, we, have, we have had some really great results and several of the schools in the Muhanga district have been rated quote unquote schools of excellence, which is a national uh, designation that they're very proud of. And the five schools of excellence in the Muhanga district uh, are schools that we've worked with those teachers. So the mayor has, has been public about our, our ability to impact the school uh, and the schools in, in her district. Very, very important for her. One of the things you'll see in these pictures is, this, is, what is uh, one of the great benefits of story-based learning. You see the teachers who are with the students. One of the teachers said to me after our last session this past June in Rwanda, he said, thank you for, for letting me love my students again. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, before they had no idea that I loved them because I was yelling at them from the chalkboard. And you know, they were doing chalk talk and memorization. Now I build stories with them and they know that I love them. 
So that value and that culture shift in their classrooms is happening and they're very engaged. Here's another picture with a couple of my students in the background moving the work outside, doing what looks like obviously a lot of fun, but this was, a, this was the teacher was having a very difficult time in a simple machines unit and she had been trained by us and the students were regularly failing the test about simple, simple, uh, simple machines, farming machines, agriculture. Rwanda is still 90% uh, agricultural, so there's, most people are farmers and villages, um, very fertile land. And she said, I'm going to use my story-based learning. So instead of talking about it, they became, the, they became the tools and they came back in, took the test. The tests that they were failing at 45, 50%, they're now getting 90, 95%. So a big part of the story-based learning is, is being in front of each other, being connected to each other, the teacher coming down from the mountain and uh, sharing the ownership of the lesson with the students. Uh, we've had really great results there and uh, has been really, really expansive. And without the idea of connecting virtually, there's no way we would have been able to make the impact and the numbers we have. Um, you'll also see there we are in the middle, there's some teachers who are investing in the work with my students. When I first was talking to the Ministry of Education in, in Rwanda about introducing story-based learning, they, they said, you know, Rwandans are, uh, are very um, private. Uh, they, they would never do all of this physical work you're talking about. Well, as you can see, uh, they're very invested in the work and, and very connected and just need that push uh, and some training and some structure. We're able to follow through on the structure uh, with the distance learning and it's something we're really excited about. And I'll talk about some of our, some of our uh, growth and development uh, with virtual learning on campus too in a minute. You, you know, our, 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 goal, our goal going to Africa is not to be, it's not, it's not to come and save the, the poor Africans. That's nonsense and that, that's a myth of, of colonizing, right? Our, our goal is to come in and collaborate and create dignified equal partnerships, which we do. Train these teachers, train these teachers to go back to their, to their classrooms and train more teachers. So, so if we're representing 60, 65 schools, then they have an obligation to train other teachers in their schools. So, so our impact, per student, per visit every year is 40, 50, and 60,000 students. So those are numbers that, are, that, are, that really helped us, obviously, and uh, sound really good when we come back and, and uh, talk about development here on campus. So our, our, our eventual goal is to leave, is, is to share this type of work and to leave. We work in a very different school in Kenya. We work, uh, Kenya is a very different country than Rwanda. Rwanda is not diverse. Uh, Kenya is very diverse. Obviously, Rwanda is French colonized and Kenya is uh, UK colonized. And we work and did some training at a small school in Kenya. Uh, about uh, one hour outside of Nairobi is a town called Limuru. And Limuru is amidst the uh, tea fields in Kenya. And we do, we do our, our work is two-pronged in Kenya. Uh, the school that I'm talking about, which is called Woodland Star International School, and it's very diverse, a lot of uh, expatriates and people doing their work from Europe will send their kids there, and there's a mix of, of uh, Kenyan kids and kids from Europe, kids from America. Um, this has become an incubator for us, and the work that the teachers are doing with the students um, has been really helpful, very hands-on. They have great internet, by the way, in both Kenya and Rwanda, and we're able to follow up on, the, on their classroom work uh, with weekly and sometimes bi-weekly uh, training sessions via Skype and Zoom. Uh, and, then, and then as Woodland Star is the incubator, they are now moving out. I have about eight teachers in uh, Kenya who are starting to move in teams to other schools in Limuru. That was the deal, that they would train other schools. And in Rwanda as well, um, the trainers that we have trained for more than two years, the experts are now going to other schools in Muhanga. So the goal of us not being needed is happening. We're really excited about that. You, <coughs> excuse me. You may also know that Kenya, which is very large, also has some of the most incredible wildlife 
and uh, natural reserve in Namara, uh, in, 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 really in the world, incredible stuff. And the man that you see in the red uh, wrapping, there's, there's some women there too, and there are other, and there are other shawls. Um, he is from the Maasai, and that's the, one of the indigenous uh, Kenyan tribes, uh, nomadic tribes that, that lives amongst the wildlife too. So uh, land, people, and animals are all unified. You can see the people next to some of the Maasai are some of the conservationists, some of the people from the conservator who, who are on the same page, but not necessarily trusted by the Maasai, which makes sense because uh, the Mzungu, those who, uh, those who are not black uh, and white and obviously from another land, uh, have a bad track record on that continent and obviously in Kenya. So they asked me to come in and do some story-based learning to resolve some conflicts and remind them that they're telling the same story. Well, this has been very successful and we returned via uh, uh, distance learning training often. It's been a very exciting part of our research and um, part of my personal life as well. Um, some of our some of our personal some of our future plans with all of this work, and I want to get to questions or any kind of conversation you might like to have. Um, as we right now, we're doing laptop Skype work, which is working fine. Oops, sorry. Um, but we'd like to because our work is so physical we put in for a couple of grants to uh, make one of the rooms here uh, near my office space as a, a, an Anne Frank Project virtual teaching and learning center, which would enable us with some more sophisticated equipment to really have a virtual training studio. Really excited about the possibility of this happening. Um, no promises yet, but um, we are getting some traction. This would enable us really to do the work with, uh, with our partners in Rwanda and in Kenya. And our hope is once we get this lab established, we would get similar uh, technology and outfits in those sites as well. So we would really be communicating on the same terms. So the potential is really exciting. The numbers that we're getting back from Rwanda and Kenya, uh, we do the work here in the city of Buffalo too, in the past two years have really been positive. So we're feeling that, that we can really answer the call um, as, in, as, as we look to more innovative ways of teaching and breaking the, the industrial teaching model. Uh, Story-based learning addresses lots of uh, popular needs right now, socio-emotional learning, restorative justice, uh, culturally sensitive work, all of those things. I always say that story-based learning is very sticky. Uh, it connects to lots of different things. So uh, we do want to extend the reach in our partner countries uh, we want to extend the, you, you know, one of the things that's funny is I was, I've been doing this work with Rwanda and Kenya for years, and I was like, wait a minute, I don't have to drive for two hours. I, I can get to that school system virtually too. So th this is, uh, this distance learning is helping us ex as we become more popular and our work is in higher demand, we couldn't possibly personally train every uh, school and organization that's asking us to come. So after that initial face-to-face uh, -face and reoccurring face-to-face, -face, most of our work happens between uh, is, is distance learning and it's been very, very effective. Um, we, are, we are hoping and planning on new countries. We've had some requests from school systems in Vietnam, in India, and Colombia as well. So um, without the distance learning, it, it would be impossible to do to scale up the way that we're scaling up. So it's been very exciting, as is this ability to talk to all of you right now. And uh, we're looking forward to virtual and real things to come. That's what I got. That's terrific, That's thank correct. you. Um, uh, just a couple questions. Uh, what has been your, the response of your students? I mean, we could only imagine that they get quite a lot out of it, but could you share some of the feedback from your students? Yeah, they're very, very excited. Really, um, as you can imagine, we can't take 11,000 students to Rwanda and to Kenya. Uh, so we take about 15 students and then they come back with stories and the students really love them, but you can also see that they would love to be there. So we now have the ability to bring Rwanda and Kenya to our students and they are thrilled. Um, it gives them a, a global perspective, puts a face, 
and a person in front of them. A lot of the schools that we work with in Buffalo are asking, can, can we connect them with, with uh, sister schools so they can build, so their kids can build stories together with kids in, in Nairobi, with kids in Muhanga. So um, the students are really feeling empowered, connected, and uh, we are getting, we're giving, they're, they, are being, they are being offered a tang, tangible evidence of the things they're learning in class. So it's really great to see uh, the global impact on our students when, when they don't have to fly for 24 hours to get it. Right. Connections are so much easily made right nowadays, which is wonderful. Yeah, really um, exciting. Other question about, um, about the, the teachers that you uh, t train, for lack of a better word, right? You go in and you use stories and you um, teach the, the teachers down there. Do you have um, any sort of plans for like a, like a train, a train the trainer kind of model? Like they would continue some of the work that you're doing and expand out? That's exactly what we do. That, yeah, is, okay. that, is, that, that is our model. So yes, our goal is to not be necessary, right? So, we, so if we're looking at 65 um, different teachers, 85, 85 teachers from 60 or so schools, they have a responsibility to train new teachers in their school. So we are completely reliant. Maybe I wasn't clear about that. Tra train the trainer is, is our model. And that's that's the way to to scale up, and we do that locally too. So when we work, we work with a high school, a middle school, and an elementary school in uh, Buffalo every semester, and the principal chooses three to five of their teachers, and we stay with them for an entire semester as they move the work into their classrooms. Once we leave, the deal is that they that their classrooms become observation laboratories for other teachers. So they have a responsibility to train other teachers in story based learning. Yep, and that was the other question about any of this work being done closer to home. So I think you've addressed that as well. Um, you know, I, I wrote down one um, comment that you said that I thought was really, um, really kind of sums up your entire presentation about using stories to move the content from the brain to the heart, right? And it's, it's those, it's the connections that we make with people and technology is just the vehicle that can help bring us together, but stories bring us together too in ways that are unique and wonderful, right? Yeah, I'm glad you said that, Erin, because, you know, sometimes we look at distance learning because it goes through these machines and technology to be impersonal, but I have found it to, to inform the socio-emotional, the heartfelt work that we do. You know, we do a really good job in higher ed stretching the brain. We don't always do such a good job stretching the heart. And I think it's a major obligation. It's in all of our missions. It's in all of our values, right? But we don't, but we don't, always, we don't always have mechanisms for that. How do we transform students? How do we, how do we get them to really prepare themselves to navigate the complexities of life. And as, as all of you know, life is much more heart stretching than it is brain stretching. So to, to, make, to admit this, to be intentional about it, and to use stories as, as our vehicle has been really successful for the Anne Frank Project. Yeah, that's terrific. Are there other uh, questions or comments? Just wait and look at the chat for a minute. All right, I think we covered everything that I saw. All right, if, well. If, you, we'll, if anybody ahead. wants any more information about our work, um, obviously I gave you a quick uh, gloss over of the work we do. Um, mm -hmm. AnnFrankProject.com is our home and there's also a place to stay connected to us. I'm not asking for money. Um, you can just sign up for a free newsletter and see the work that we're doing. Um, and I'm happy to talk about uh, the work we do and, and how it grew and what we're doing now. Like I said, we do an annual social justice festival and we take, uh, we'll do a call for proposals in January and February for that. And that's a two day social justice festival that happens early October every year. We've done that for over 11 years now and had well over 50,000 people on campus 
So we are always open to new ways to look at story, uh, new, that it's not just a theater thing, it is a sociology thing, it is a chemistry thing, it is an architecture thing, it is a science thing. So we are, we are open, look out for our, our call for proposals. We'd love more SUNY folks uh, and their work to be highlighted at, uh, at our festival. Well, that's great. Is that something that is um, uh, advertised or in some way noted on the Anne Frank site, the Anne Frank project always, site? Always, always on the site. And if okay. you sign up for our, um, our, our bulletin, we will, you'll get specific notifications. But it's always on our site. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. All of those things. Okay. And I put the URL in the chat for folks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Well, thank you very much, Drew, for sharing with us today. Um, just to let folks on the call know, today's session was recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. You can access all of our webinar recordings for the week and resources at um, the URL where you, where you signed on. So I'll pop that over here in the chat for you. And uh, there are additional activities happening around the globe, actually, for National Distance Learning Week. We hope you'll take a look at the U.S. Distance Learning Association's site. They are the sponsors of National Distance Learning Week, and they have uh, things happening all over, which is wonderful. So we appreciate your participation today and really do hope to see you at another distance learning event soon. Thanks, Thanks. I'll, tell, I'll tell everybody what we always say when we leave schools, you matter, your stories matter. It's important <laughs> to tell them. You don't tell them, someone else will, and they'll probably get it wrong. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.